Okay, so uh, today owners uh, asked me to, to uh, present one of my work and the other work from uh, Iman uh, Ibrahimi on uh, coordinate control for uh, prefetch for multi-core systems. Uh, now I'll go over my work, stage memory scaling first. And I believe you owner has already gone through this a little bit in the lecture on Monday, is that correct? Right, so some of them might look familiar to you and this talk shouldn't take that long, period, like around half an hour. If you have any questions in between, feel free to ask. Right, so in our work, we observed that heterogeneous CPU GPU systems require memory scale with large with buffers. And the problem is, actually, am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me? Click in the back, okay. Uh, the problem is existing monolithic application where scalar designs are hard to scale when you have big buffer size. So our solution we propose propose a mechanism called stage memory scheduling, or SMS, that decomposes the memory controller into three simpler stages. And we call the first stage, stage one, the batch formation, that maintains row buffer locality. Stage two, the batch scalar that reduces interference between different applications. And stage three, the DRAM scalar that issues requests to DRAM. And compared to state of art uh, memory scalers, SMS is Signal is simpler to design, and it also provides high performance and fairness. <coughs> and now let me go with the background on the memory uh, interference problem in uh, CMP systems. In, in a, in a uh, chip multiprocessor systems, you have multiple cores, and they interact with the DRAM where they want to send a request in order to access the data by sending this to the memory controller, which consists of the memory request buffers and the memory scalers. So when a core generates a request to DRAM, the job of the memory request buffer is to store these requests from different cores. And the memory scaler will select one of these requests in order to get the associated data back to the core. And as you can see here, when you have multiple cores, they are all content for this limited offshift bandwidth and inter application interference can degrade system performance. So the memory scaler can help mitigating this problem, but how, how does the memory scaler uh, deliver good performance and fairness? There are three uh, generally, uh, general principles of memory scaling. First, firstly, it should prioritize all buffer hit requests, which also been addressed by Rick Rickson et al. in ISCA 2000. Uh, because if you prioritize for buffer hit request, it will maximize memory bandwidth. And here's an example. Suppose you have five requests and sorted by the age. And request one is the oldest, and request five is the, the, the newest. And even though request one is older than request two, but because the currently open row in DRAM is row B, in this case, it's better to service request two first. Uh, the next thing is it should prioritize latency sensitive application because this will maximize system throughput. And here's an example, suppose you have four application with different memory intensity. Previous work have observed that if you prioritize application that has lower memory intensity, which generally refers to uh, application that has uh, more latency sensitivity, they, they will progress faster because they have longer compute phase. So in this case, it's better to prioritize application number two over other application. Lastly, it needs to ensure that no application is stopped to, to minimize unfairness. And now I'll explain what would happen if the GPU is integrated into the systems. Because current and future system integrated GPU along with multiple cores because this will lower the cost of the systems as well lower the communica communication cost between the CPU and the GPU. But the GPU shares the main memory with the CPU cores. And the GPU is much more memory intensive compared to the CPU. So how, how should memory scaling be done when the GPU is integrated on chip? What would have happened if you have the GPU integrated on chip as uh, GPU will send a lot of requests because they are much more memory intensive to the memory buffers. And GPU occupies this, they occupy a significant portion of the request buffers, leading to some requests on a CPU unable to inject into this uh, request buffers. And this limits the memory control visibility of different CPU applications. And this can lead to poor scaling decision because they cannot offer the full uh, behavior of different CPU application behavior. 
One nice solution is to increase the size of the main request buffers. However, when you increase the size of the request buffers, it also required more complicated logic to analyze memory requests and analyze efficient characteristics and also assigns and enforce priorities. And this leads to a high complexity, high power, and large data area, which is bad, and we would like to solve that. So our goal is to design a new memory control uh, scheduler that is scalable to accommodate large number of requests, easy to implement, application aware, and also able to provide high performance and fairness, especially in the context of heterogeneous CPU GPU systems. <coughs> and in order to address uh, our goal, we make some several observations. First, let's look at the key function of memory controller. Memory controller needs to consider the three different things at the same time when choosing next request. First, it should try to maximize row buffer heads because this will maximize memory bandwidth. Also, it should manage contention between different applications in order to maximize system throughput and fairness. Lastly, it needs to ensure that uh, it satisfies DRAM timing constraints. And the current design accomplishes all these three functions in a centralized memory controller design, which can be complex, especially when you have a large request buffers. So our key idea is to decouple this functional task into uh, <coughs> different stages and partition the tasks across uh, several simpler hardware structures, which we call stages. And now let's look at the three functional tasks I mentioned earlier. Uh, we propose stage one, which we call batch formation, that which within each application, we group requests to the same row into batches. And when the batch is formed, they are considered by the stage two, the batch schedulers that schedule batches from different applications. And when the batch is scheduled, they are sent to the last stage, the DRAM quant schedulers that issue requests from an already scheduled order to each bank. And now I'll explain the mechanism uh, stage memory scaling or SMS, and how we can decouple this monolithic schedulers into stages of simpler schedulers. And first, I'll explain how stage one, the batch formation work. <coughs> the goal of stage one is to try to maximize row buffer heads. So at each core, we want to batch requests that access the same row together with a limited time window in order to ensure forward progress. And a batch is ready to schedule under two conditions. First, when the next request accesses a different row, a batch is formed. And when the time window for the batch formation expired, a batch is also formed. And we can keep this stage simple by using a protocol fivefold. And here's an example of how the batch formation is done. Suppose you have a request that accesses in row B, and then the subsequent requests also go to the same row. In this case, the, the two requests will be grouped together into a batch. And the first criterion when a batch is formed is when the next request, which is shown in this example, want to access a different role. In here, a batch is formed. Also, another criteria on when a batch is formed is after the group of requests, uh, waiting for the next request that accesses a different role for a while, uh, when, and, and also the time window expires a batch is formed in order to ensure that eventually these two requests will be scheduled. And this process happens across all the cores. And now I'll explain the, how batch formation is formed. Uh, I'll explain the, the, the mechanism in the batch schedulers. And the goal of this stage is to minimize application interference. And because stage one already formed batches within each application, stage two schedule only has to schedule batches from different applications. <coughs> and because uh, the batch in stage one already is sorted because it is FIFO by, by the order of arrival, it only has to schedule all this batch from each application. So the next question is which application batch should be scheduled next? And the, the goal is to maximize system performance and fairness. And to, in order to achieve this goal, we, uh, the batch schedulers choose between two different policies. The first policy is a charge off first, where it prioritizes uh, applications with the fewest number of outstanding memory requests because these applications make fast forward progress. And the benefit is it can give good system performance and fairness. However, GPU and memory intensive applications can get uh, deprioritized. 
And the other policy that the batch formation can, uh, batch scheduling can use is the round robin policy that prioritize applications in a round robin manner to ensure that the memory intensive application can make uh, progress. And the benefit is the GPU and memory intensive application can make uh, uh, progress. However, because they are memory intensive, they can severely interfere with other applications and slow down others. And because the importance of the GPU can vary between dif uh, different systems and systems, and also over time, the scaling policy needs to be able to adapt to this. So our solution is to have a hybrid policy where at every cycle, with the property of P, you can use the charge of first, uh, the, the batch scaling will use the charge of first policy that will provide more benefits to the, uh, the CPU. And with the property of one minus P, the batch scaling policy will use the round robin policy that provide more benefit to the, C, uh, the GPU. And system software can configure this P based on the importance or the weight of the GPU, where the higher the GPU important is, the lower the p-value it should be. And now I'll explain how the first two stages, the batch formation and the batch scaler works. I'll explain how the DRAM command scaler works. And because the high level policy decision has already been made by the first two stages, where stage one already maintain robot for locality, and stage two minimizes inter application interference. Stage three doesn't need to do any further scaling besides uh, service string requests while satisfying the timing constraints. So we can uh, implement this as a simple per bank 54Q. And here's an example of how all the three stages interact with each other. First, you have the batch formation that group requests that access the same role together. And there are two criteria when, uh, when a batch is formed. First, when a next request to the, from the same application accessing a different role, which is shown, shown in this example, a batch is formed. Uh, and the next criteria is when a request is, uh, the time window for the batch formation expires, a batch is also formed. And the batch formation process will happen across all the cores, including the GPU, which is shown here. And once the batch is formed, they are considered by the batch scalers in order to be scheduled to the next stage using two different policies. The first policy is a charge of first that will select a batch from an application that has the fewest number of outstanding requests across all the three stages, with, uh, in this case, it's the, the purple uh, batch from core four. The other policy is a round robin policy that will just uh, schedule batches in a round robin manner, which is shown in the, uh, this example. And whenever a DRAM is available and can service the next request for in, in each bank, then the DRAM command scaler will issue requests to the associated bank in order to get the data back to the core. And with this decoupled design, we are able to, uh, comparing to a raw hit first scheduler or FRCFS, stage memory, memory scaling consumes 66% less area and 46% less static power. And this reduction comes from the fact that we decouple the monolithic schedulers into stages of simpler schedulers. And at each stage, we have simple schedule that consider fewer pro uh, properties at a time to make a scaling decision. Each stage also has a simple buffer, uh, buffers that use a FIFO instead of out-of-order buffer. Each stage also only have a portion of the total buffer size, so buffering is distributed across different stages. And now I'll show you the result of SMS. We perform our simulation using a cycle level simulator, modeling 16 out-of-order CPU cores, one GPU modeling AMD Radeon 50X70, and we model the main memory using DDR3 1600 DRAM with four channels, one rack per channel, and eight banks per channel. And we use Specs 2006 for a CPU workload, and recent games and GPU benchmarks for the GPU workload. And we categorize workload into seven different workload categories based on the memory intensity of CPU application from low, medium, to high. And we compare our uh, proposal SMS to three previously proposed scaling algorithm. The first one is first ready, first, and first serve, which is proposed by uh, Rickner et al. That prioritize for buffer hit request. And this maximizes DRAM throughput, however, it can have low multi-core performance because they are not application aware. Uh, the next scaling policy we compare to is Atlas, which uh, is proposed by Kim 
at all at HPC 2010. And this prioritized latency sensitive application. And the benefit of Atlas, Atlas is it gives good multi core performance. However, it can have low fairness because it deprioritized memory intensive application. Lastly, lastly we compare uh, SMS to thread cluster memory scaling, which is also proposed by Kim et al. in Micro 2010. And TCM clusters low and high intensity application and treat, uh, treat each of them separately. And the benefit is it can give good multi-core performance, also high fa uh, fairness. However, in the context of CPU GPU systems, we found that TCM has become non-robust because they misclassify latency sensitive application and put them in the wrong clusters. And in terms of evaluation metric, we measure CPU performance using a CPU weighted speedup. And we measure the GPU performance using a frame rate speedup, which is the frame rate of the GPU application when it's running with other applications compared to when it's running alone. And we measure the system performance by uh, a metric called CPU GPU weighted speedup, which is the sum of the CPU weighted speedup and the GPU speedup. And then we multiply the GPU speedup by the GPU weight that can vary from for, for different systems, depending on how important the GPU is. And we, we will show our evaluation, evaluation on two different scenarios. The first one is the CPU-focused systems, and also the second one is the GPU-focused systems. In the CPU-focused systems, the GPU has a low weight of 1, and the CPU-GPU weight speedup is CPU uh, weight speedup plus the GPU speedup. And we configure stage memory scaling such that the probability of doing charge drop first is set to 0 0.9, which mostly uses uh, charge drop first batch scaling policy that prioritizes latency sensitive application, mainly the CPU. And this plot shows the performance of the CPU focus systems. The y axis is the CPU GPU weighted speed up, and the x axis is the performance of the system for different. Uh, previously proposed mechanism, including SMS, which is the blue bar, and we set the probability to 0 0.9. And as you can see here, uh, short job first batch scaling policy allows the latency sensitive application to get service as fast as possible. So as a result, we are able to gain 17.2% improvement over Atlas, with, which is the best previous scaling uh, algorithm for this context of uh, CPU GPU systems. Also, SM is much less complex compared to the other previous schedulers. And now, uh, on a C uh, GPU focus system, when the GPU has high weight, in this case, we set it to 1,000. We configure stage memory scaling such that the probability of doing short job first is set to zero, which means we always use round robin policy for the batch scaling. And this prioritizes memory intensive application, including the GPU. And this plot showed the performance of the GPU focus systems. And the y axis is CPU with GPU weight speed up when the weight is 1000 uh, for the GPU. And the x axis is the uh, performance bar for each of the different previously proposed scaling, including SMS, when we set the probability to be zero, which means we always do round robin. And when we, the, the round robin batch scaling policy scheduled GPU requests more frequently. As for a result, we are able to gain about 1% performance improvement over FRCFS, which is the best previously proposed scaling. And SMS is also still much less complex compared to previous schedulers. And in this plot, we show the performance of uh, the best previous schedulers selected from FRCFS, Atlas, and TCM for different GPU weight. So in this region, we found that Atlas is performing the, 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 the best. And in this region, we found that TCM is performing the best. And lastly, when the GPU weight becomes really high, we found that FRCFS is performing the best. Comparing to the best period scaler at different GPU weight, SMS was able to uh, perform better if you configure the, the probability of P to the maximum value, the maximum, maximum system performance value. So at every GPU weight, SMS outperformed the best period scaling algorithm for that rate. In the paper, we also provide the fairness evaluation. And we are able to gain 47.6 improvement over the best period algorithm. Also, we show the individual CPU and GPU performance breakdown. We also uh, have uh, studies on the CPU-only scenarios, and SMS was able to 
uh, perform competitively with other previous scaling algorithms. We also show the scale results, and the conclusion is SMS performance and fairness scales better than previous algorithm as the number of cores and memory channel increases. We also provide an analysis of SMS design parameters. And now let me conclude. Uh, we observed that heterogeneous CPU GPU system require memory scalers with large effect buffers. Existing memory scalers designed are hard to scale when you increase the, the request buffer size. So our proposal decomposes the memory controller into three simpler stages. The first one is batch formation that maintains row buffer locality. And the stage two is a batch scaler that reduces interference between application. And lastly, the DRAM format scaler or sta uh, stage three issues requests to DRAM. And compared to the state of the art memory scalers, SMS is significantly simpler and more scalable to design. Also, it provides high performance and fairness. And that's the end of the first talk. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, no? Should I just head into the next one? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I guess I'll take that as a no. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I'll be more than glad to answer questions. And the next talk is related to prefetcher. And I know it's not really related to memory scaling or anything at all, uh, but prefetcher is important. And in this paper, it addresses uh, the, the problem for prefetcher. Even though it's accurate, it can uh, incur a slowdown in the multi-core systems. And this paper is proposed by Iman, uh, Ibrahimi, and other people from the University of Texas and also owner. In I think in 2009, that is to live. So the motivation is uh, aggressive refetching can improve memory intensity, uh, memory latency tolerance of many applications when they run al alone. However, when you prefetch con uh, contrarily when in a CPU system, you prefetch uh, contrarily executing applications. This can lead to significant system performance degradation. Why? Because different applications can interfere with others. So the prefetch from one application can interfere with a demand request from other applications. Also, it can uh, become a bandwidth base. So this problem is uh, known as a prefetcher cause intercore interference, where the prefetch of one application contend with the prefetches, or including the demand requests of other applications. And this plot showed a system performance improvement of an ideal case where if what would happen if you can remove all the prefetcher cost intercore interference problem in the shared resources. And the y-axis is the performance of a system compared to no throttling. And the x-axis is the performance at different workloads when in, the, in an ideal case that we remove all the prefetcher cost intercore interference. And as you can see, we can gain up to 56% in performance improvement if we can uh, reduce this prefetcher cost in the core interference. So now let me go over the back, back, background of uh, uh, the very related prefetch and prefetch, uh, uh, how to control prefetch request. So increasing prefetcher accuracy can reduce prefetcher cost in the core interference. And there are several works that address this problem. One of them is a single core prefetch aggressiveness throttling, which throttle a prefetch request from each core proposed by Siran at HPCR 2007. Also, there are other works like filtering inaccurate prefetches or dropping inaccurate prefetches at the memory controller proposed by different people. And all of these techniques operate independent, independently on the prefetch of each application. So uh, the, the one core, the, the, the throttling technique for one core doesn't know what would happen in the prefetch demand, uh, prefetch request from other cores. And now let, let me go over uh, one of the previous work, which is a single core prefetch aggressiveness throttling, which, uh, which is called the feedback directed prefetching, proposed by Sirian et al. at HPCA 2007. Uh, in feedback directed prefetching, we use the prefetcher feedback information 
local to the prefetch check core, and this information includes the prefetch accuracy, prefetch timeliness, and prefetch cache pollution. And then, uh, this mechanism will dynamically adapt the prefetch aggressiveness in order to figure out what's the good prefetch distance, also what's the good prefetch degree for each application. And what do we mean by prefetch distance or prefetch degree? Prefetch distance means how far ahead are we going to prefetch a request. Prefetch degree is how many requests do we allow to be prefetched at the same time uh, in parallel. And this is shown to perform better than and also consume less bandwidth than the static aggressiveness configuration. But uh, there are also some shortcomings from the, this prior approaches to prefetcher control because you can have high interference caused by an accurate prefetcher. And in this example, uh, uh, there are multiple cores, and each core sends a demand request, which is denoted as DEM, and then the number is the number of core ID that it, uh, the, the request comes from. And each of them acts as a different uh, role and also stay in a different location in the share cache. And suppose right now, uh, the DRAM is servicing prefetch 1 and 3, and the row buffer for bank 0 has a uh, prefetch 1 row address, and the bank 1 has prefetch 3 row address. And in the memory controller, there's a demand request from core 2. Also in the share cache, note that, that there's also a uh, demand request from core 2 with the address A and B, Right, uh, already in the share cache, and also there's one prefetch, uh, and also demand from port zero. And suppose that the prefetch that are being processed in DRAM come go back to the, the, the uh, uh, got the data and go back to the core. As you can see here, what happened is the prefetch number one will replace the demand request to address uh, that for address uh, in the share cache. And the same thing happened for prefetch three. Suppose they are mapped to that that. Uh, particular line. And suppose that core 2 send a demand request to address A, which has already been evicted from the cache, share cache in this case. Now, uh, this will become a, a cache miss, which will incur a longer latency for core 2. And in this case, even though the prefetch is accurate because, uh, because core 1 send a demand request that's already been prefetch, which is the prefetch one. This incur a longer latency for core two, so the core two will get slowed down. And this demand request, instead of being hit in the cache, now need to be sent to the memory controller. And because prefetch, uh, prefetch three is, is accurate, uh, if the core three happened to send a prefetch request, again, before the, this demand request to core 2 is service. Within the memory controller, because prefetch 3 uh, already have the row, row open, the memory controller might actually service this prefetch before this demand request, leading to even more slowdown for the, the core 2 because it has the demand request 2 waiting there for a while. Also, this can happen to the prefetch coming from core 1 because it, both of them are accurate then they also, both of them incur a row buffer head. They will get sent to the DRAM before this demand request from call number two. So in a CMP system, accurate prefetcher can cause significant interference. Excuse me, I guess my tone is not sorry sure. It's okay. I'm very sorry, I have to get back. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so in a, in a CMP system, even though a prefetcher is accurate, it can still cause significant interference with uh, other applications that are executing concurrently. So this, there's also another shortcoming for, uh, that happened in the cache, where suppose you have a, an accurate prefetch for call zero and call one, and right now the prefetch degree is two, so it send two prefetch requests at a time. And suppose you send the prefetch request replacing this demand request in uh, set, set zero. And because they are uh, accurate, they are used 
by core 0 and core 1 uh, respectively. And then core 2 can still send demand requests replacing this prefetch request, causing this interference between the cache, uh, share cache and has this like, cache pollution problem. Uh, also, the same thing happened to set one, and the prefetch is used. They evict some demand requests from core two and core three. And because they are accurate, the previously proposed mechanism of feedback directed uh, prefetching will throttle up the prefetch degree. So now, instead of prefetching two requests at the same time, it will start to prefetch four requests at the same time. As you can see here, now it would actually replace the whole cache uh, set. Uh, the whole demand request that already in the cache set by this all these prefetch requests. So the local only prefetch control techniques has no mechanism to detect this intercall interference. Um, uh, this example will show uh, show what can happen in in the in the systems. In the plot, there's a speed up over a long run of four diff uh, different application LBM, which is this. Uh, set of bars, swim, uh, crafty, and bc2. And the green bar is uh, no prefetching. And the, the yellow bar is prefetching without any throttling. So you keep prefetch request. The red bar is the feedback directed prefetching, where you uh, try to improve the accuracy of the prefetch. And if the prefetch become more accurate, you, you throttle up request, which means you prefetch more requests. And lastly, it is the proposed mechanism that try to have a global control over different uh, the prefetch from different cores. And as you can see here, in, in the case where you have no throttling, even though uh, this application, LBM and SWIM, speeding up compared to no prefetching, in these two cases of Crafty and BC2, the performance degrades a lot, leading to an average uh, slow down for the systems. The same thing happened for the feedback directed prefetching, where LBM and SWIM speeding up, but then Crafty and BC2 slow down. So as a result, both uh, the system performance degrades. However, if you are able to control uh, the prefetch request globally, even though you gain less speed up for LBM and SWIM, you gain the slowdown incurring in class 3 and BC2 isn't as severe as earlier. So as a result, we are able to gain performance improvement. So the approach that this paper used is to use both uh, global and per core feedback information to determine the each, uh, each prefetch, uh, prefetch aggressiveness. And now I'll go over how this is done. And this mechanism is called Hierarchical Prefetch Aggressiveness Control, or HPAC. And in HPAC, you have a, in each core, you have a prefetcher and a local controller that control how much are you going to prefetch. And this try to maximize the prefetching performance of each of the individual core. And then you have a global control controller that keep track of different uh, uh, prefetcher cause intercore interference and then control this interference in the shared memory systems. So what are the information that we need to keep track? First, for each of the core, we need to keep track of the accuracy of the prefetcher. In addition, we need to keep track of the bandwidth information on how much bandwidth is consumed by core and how much bandwidth is required by other cores. And in addition to that, we need to keep track of how much cache pollution happened in the share cache because of the prefetcher. And the global control can, will make two decisions. It can either accept or override the decision made by the local control the, uh, here to improve overall system performance, where each core for the local control will send the local throttling decision. And the global control will send back whether the final throttling decision, whether it allows this local decision or it will overwrite the local decision. And now I'll go over a different terminology used uh, in this paper. The global feedback metric uh, measures the 
accuracy of prefetcher at each core, which is denoted as ACCI. And also, it needs to keep track of the, the pollution for uh, causing by the individual core's prefetcher. And this pollution, what I mean by pollution is the demand cache line of other cores that get evicted by a core's prefetch uh, that are requested by subsequent that are requested by a different core that leads to eviction. Uh, you also need to keep track of the bandwidth consumed by core I and also bandwidth needed by other core J. And these two accounts how long requests from this uh, each core need to hog the DRAM banks and also how long does the request from other cores have to wait for the DRAM bank to, uh, because of the request from this particular core. And now I'll explain how the cache pollution is measured. Uh, in order to calculate intercore inter cache pollution, you have a, a structure called pollution filter for each core, where you have a hash function and you have two bits, uh, the core ID and the pollution bits. And when you have a prefetch from core I that evicts a core uh, J's demand and request from the shared cache, you, you have this evicted line address from core J going to the hash function. And this will map to some of the, the role in this uh, pollution bit and core ID set. And then we will set the pollution bit to be one and we set the core ID to be called J because J is evicted beca uh, because of the prefetch request from core I. And when core J want, uh, want to uh, demand this particular cache that already been evicted, this missing line address from core J will be sent to the hash function, which will be mapped to the line with the pollution bit set and core ID J. And when this match, we increment the pollution of core I by one. And now, uh, HPAC or hierarchy of prefetcher aggressive control will make the control decision based on different accuracy. If you have a high accuracy from coming from core I, and the local control, because it has high accuracy, it wants to throttle up the prefetcher aggressiveness. But if, you, if, if this same core also causes high pollution in the shared cache, also it can consume, consume a lot of bandwidth, as well as you have a, a lot of uh, other applications still require a lot of bandwidth. In this case, uh, the global control will enforce the, the, the prefetch for core I to throttle down requests and re refuse, it will overwrite the local control that wants to throttle up in order to decrease the interference from this application that calls to other cores. And the heuristic for global control is based on classification of uh, like whether it's going to cause severe interference or borderline interference or no interference or moderate interference from accurate prefetcher. And if a prefetcher from core I will cause uh, severe interference, the global control will reduce the aggressiveness of interference, pre uh, interfering prefetcher. If the interference is borderline, the global control will prevent prefetcher from uh, trans in a, from transitioning from borderline to the severe case. And it allows local control to only throttle down but not throttle up. And if the, uh, the current interference is moderate or there's no interference from uh, an accurate prefetcher, the global control will allow local control to maximize local benefit from prefetching. So here's the breakdown of, of uh, the control policies where you can have a uh, different pollution where you can, uh, a prefetch can cause low pollution or high pollution. It can be accurate or inaccurate. And in addition, it can consume a lot of bandwidth uh, or, or low bandwidth consumption. And additionally, you can uh, have a case where others uh, require a lot of bandwidth as of other doesn't really require a lot of bandwidth. And in the case of CV interference, uh, you can have 
a prefix that cause low pollution. However, it is inadequate and it causes a lot of bandwidth consumption. And others require a lot of bandwidth. In this case, the global control will throttle down the prefetch aggressiveness. In the other case, if you have high pollution, if, if the prefetch from cold eye has high, caused high pollution, and also it's inaccurate, this causes severe interference and it should be throttled down. However, if it's highly accurate, but it consumes a lot of bandwidth, and other uh, application also would like to uh, access the, the, the shared resources and require high bandwidth, this also causes CV interference and should be throttled down. So these are the three cases that cause CV interference, and the global con uh, controller will throttle down the local prefecture uh, decision. And in terms of hardware costs in the full core systems, uh, the total hardware cost for local, local control and global control is around 15 kilobytes. And that's another additional cost on top of uh, the feedback directed uh, prefetching is only 1.5 uh, kilobytes. And HPAC doesn't require any structures or logic that are on the processor critical path. And now I'll go over the evaluation. Uh, they use an x86 cycle accurate simulator with uh, baseline processors modeling for Y issue of order. 256 entry uh, LB, 2 megabyte check cache, and it models DDR3 1333 megahertz with 4 bit wide uh, call to memory bus. And the threshold used by HPAC is uh, for the accuracy, it's considered to be inaccurate if the accuracy is below 0.6, and the prefecture is accurate if the accuracy is higher than 0.6. And the bandwidth consumption for each application, it consider high bandwidth consumption, is a bandwidth is more than 50K. The pollution is 90, and the bandwidth required by other applications is 75K. And here's the performance breakdown of uh, two, three different mechanisms. No prefetching, feedback directed prefetcher, which is previously proposed, and hash pack, which is this way. And the others categorize applications into four different classes. The first classes, which they call class one, is the case where uh, there's the interference causing by the prefetcher. As you can see, if you use uh, feedback directed prefetching, uh, it can incur some slowdown. In this case, for example, it is performing worse than baseline, and where, where you prefetch request. So the baseline, the red bar is. Uh, no throttling, you, you, you prefetch without any throttling. And as you can see in this class, uh, if you have this global controller, you, sh you are able to gain performance improvement over previously proposed mechanism. In class two, this is a case where you don't have that much uh, interference so, across different applications. So if, if you only implement the feedback directed prefetching, you are fine. So in this case, uh, HPAC doesn't give that much performance improvement over FDP because the global control doesn't really have to overwrite the local control design uh, decision. And in this class is the class of application where the interference from prefetch is severe. So even though you use uh, feedback directed prefetching, you are unable to throttle requests because different application Prefetch uh, prefetch requests still interfere with others, and as you can see, it, as you can see, it's better off without any prefetching. But even in this case, HPAC, which has a global controller that uh, overrides the local uh, throttling decision, are able to gain performance improvement over either no prefetches or FTP. And the last classes is the class where. Uh, there's no uh, inter-application interference for the prefetch request. And as you can see here, HPAC doesn't really degrade performance compared to FTP. And as a result, HPAC uh, is able to gain 15 performance improvement for across all the classes. Okay, and I kind of skipped animation. <laughs> okay, so the summary of other results shown in the paper, uh, 
uh, there's another further result and analysis that shows the result with different type of memory controller, uh, which is first ready, first time, first serve, and the prefetch aware DRAM controller. Uh, so sh they also show the effect of HPAC on system fairness. Also, they show the HPAC performance on an eight core system. They ha also have multiple types of prefetcher per core and different local control policies. And in addition, they have a sensitive analysis to system parameters. So uh, in conclusion, prefetcher cost in the core interference can destroy the potential performance of prefetching. And when prefetching for concurrently executing application in, in the CMP, uh, and this doesn't exist, this problem doesn't exist in a single application environment. So they develop a low-cost hierarchical solution which throttle different core feature in a coordinated manner. And the key is to take a global feedback into account to determine the aggressiveness of each core feature. And this improves system performance by 15% compared to no throttling on a four core systems. And this enables performance improvement from prefetching that is not possible without it on, the memory workload, uh, on many workloads. And that's it. Any questions? OK. And yes, some more questions. OK, good. <laughs> Uh, and Bonnie uh, only told me to present this to Wix. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or Han or Bonnie.